Welcome. I'm Riley Karsh. I'm Tova Copan. We are thrilled to bring you the We Go Boldly podcast. Let's talk big burning questions, life changes, and maybe a bit of personal business. Let's be bold and brave together. Are you ready? I am. Here comes the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to We Go Boldly, the podcast. We are so very happy to have you with us today on this episode 16 of season six. This is a long season. We have a it lot is. to say it on is. busyness and self-worth this uh, this season. So welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, like I said, we are super happy to have you with us. And uh, we can't wait to dive into today's topic. It's going to be maybe a little bit heavy today, but we'll get through it and we'll have an interesting conversation, I think. Before we do that, I am, uh, as I always do, going to welcome to the show my fantastical, wonderful, lovely, delightful co-host, Tova. How are you today, Tova? What's up? What's happening? Um, you know, I am, I am good. I am once again, as we, uh, get to the stage of the season where uh, we are very firmly in one season of the weather. And when, by the time this airs, it will be like, right now I'm looking around, I have seashells in front of me. <laughs> and when this airs, uh, I will have like little pumpkins and apples and whatnot. Like That's I will not, true. you know, right now I'm smelling a pineapple cilantro candle and uh by the you know when when one of you is listening to this you may be smelling like a cranberry apple candle i don't know so um <laughs> i'm i am you know loving the summerness of the world i am existing in but i you know i'm not totally against fall so i'm pretty psyched that that we'll be listening yeah know, we'll be listening and by to not this. totally against fall you mean it's your favorite season ever and you love it so, so yeah, much. I mean, I assume that will change when I have a summer house and take all of August off. Yes. Um, but until that's that spot. Um, yeah, I do love I love a good fall, but I still have lots of beach in front of me. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. excited about that. Um, I, I do just have to laugh specifically because of our topic today. But also I saw a meme and it we've used it, you know, year after year as the the country has fallen into shambles but it's like <laughs> like what are you ex you know are you looking forward to fall or what are your plans for for the fall and the memes like you know they were talking about autumn and i was like thinking of like the fall of civilization <laughs> so i'm excited to get out my <sighs> mug about my favorite season being the fall of the patriarchy and yes. uh so we're right we're we're right here we're ready that's to it. go that's what we're talking about today <laughs> um so on that on that uplifting note, uh, <laughs> we are talking today about society and busyness, and we cannot talk about society and busyness, of course, without talking about uh, the patriarchy, which is a broad, broad, and slightly sad. I topic. have a definition, and actually. we have definitions, yeah, and yeah. Uh, so Tova's going to get into the definitions. We're going to talk about patriarchy. We're going to talk about white supremacy. We're going to talk about burnout. Um, and these are some heavy topics and we know they're controversial for some people, but they're important and they're things we have to, you know, we have to get into and we have to face and focus on in order to really kind of move our own futures forward and our right. own personal growth forward. So Tova, take over. Let's get into some definitions and set some ground rules here. All right. So um, before we hop into the definitions, I did I did want to say, you know, our our purpose for having this whole conversation is we're talking about busyness, and we we I read one line, um, and I think it was in an interview without with actually I I read a lot in preparation for this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I dove deep. I started it actually a week ahead than I normally do, so I had lots of time. Um, but there was one line from a article, I believe where they were interviewing the authors of the book Burnout. And the article said, they debunked the popular idea that we women are our own worst enemy, saying mm. instead that the real enemy is the game itself, which tries to convince us 
that it's not the enemy. And that really, to me, summed up why this conversation today is important. It is important to talk about busyness and to-do lists and goal setting and and self-worth and how it all interacts. And all of those conversations are so important to have because this is the world that we currently live in. But at the same time, it is important to know that I don't want to say we are set up to fail, but the system is not actually working for women in general. It is not working for people of color in general. Um, it is a very, it is a system. Our country is based on a system of white supremacy and patriarchy, and it leads to uh, a variety of really horrible things, including that feeling of busyness and burnout. So yeah. um, before <laughs> I'm going to, before, before okay, you go. get to the definitions, I just want to amplify that because if you are like, you know, if you are feeling uncomfortable about that statement, I just want you to sit with it for a little bit and allow yourself to accept the possibility that the system we live in here in the States, but also in l large swaths of the world, that the system is rigged against women and people of color. And it's not you know, necessarily something you've thought about before or that you've been comfortable acknowledging or looking at and that you don't have to sit in a feeling of shame or guilt about that. But you do have to examine it and you have to right. look at it and acknowledge it in order to be able to accept like the rest of this conversation we're about to have. And I've had so many of these conversations with people who are not even willing to take that first step, which is why I'm just sort of amplifying what Tova said and, and having, you know, at, just asking you to take the moment to allow yourself to sit in the feelings you might have about that first step of going, okay, well maybe, you know, what if, what if the system is rigged? What if right. this is true? So just take that pause and reflect moment and, and you know, give it a shot. Give it a, give it a chance to be real for you for just for the whatever, however long this this episode goes today. I don't know, 45 minutes, two hours, hours whatever, <laughs> whatever we wind up doing. But give uh, it a yeah. chance before and, before you dismiss it. And I, I want to say, I promise we are really getting to the definitions because they are really important. Yeah. Um, you can still have a belief that the patriarchy uh, is to blame for a lot of things. By the way, if you ever listen to the listen to the book um, Burnout, I love it because they're like they always say the patriarchy, Ugh, like every yeah. time they say it. Yes. Um, but um, you can still have a really nice husband or yep. son or father who took on 50% of the responsibility at home, who is a stay at home dad, whatever you want to like that. Cool, 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 cool. All of that can happen and you can still exist in a system that's built on the patriarchy. So right. that's, and let's extend that a little farther. You can be a white person who doesn't think that you've actively been racist because you haven't said anything racist. And this is where we start getting really uncomfortable. Mm. We still benefit from a system, we as white women, in this case, still benefit from a system that is built on white supremacy. So right. those are our baselines that we are starting with. So let's look at the definitions to get even more baseline, I guess. <laughs> um, so the patriarchy is a system of society or government which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. A society, a community organized on patriarchal lines, that's like kings and whatnot. But um, almost every society in the history of the world not every society, let's be very clear, but the large majority of societies in the history of the world have been built with this as a structure somehow. And and people are going to say, oh, but Tova, what about, you know, the CEO of Pepsi who was a woman, but she was in charge. Cool, cool. Yeah, there's one woman of color in the Fortune 500 companies. So... Let's let let's get those numbers a little higher before we say anything. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Uh, white supremacy, the belief that white people constitute a superior race. And hold up, you don't actually have to believe that to benefit from white supremacy. 
uh, and should therefore dominate society, typically to the exclusion or detriment of other racial and ethnic groups, in particularly Black or Jewish people, or in our case, brown people, any Muslim people, anyone who is not white Christian in our country. Um, so now let's talk about burnout. <laughs> let's get a definition for that. It is actually a syndrome uh, characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a de decrease in self-fulfillment. It is like busyness to the max, right? It's that feeling of busyness, but like chronic. Um, in 2018, the World Health Organization, WHO to its friends, recognized burnout syndrome in its international classification of diseases as an occupational condition linked to several health systems, such as fatigue, changing sleep habits, and substance abuse. So these are all very, very real things. Uh, and we need to talk about them. And we need to recognize that they exist because while I am having a particularly stressful moment of time in my life and have um, like this specific moment, I'm assuming by the time you listen to it, this moment is like, way past mm -hmm. which i'm uh praying for but uh at this actual moment that i'm saying this and so yeah i you know i meditated last night before i went to bed i meditated this morning i'll probably meditate one or two more times today just to like really help i want to do some affirmation work um gratitude journaling you know just getting everything out as much as i can um we love all of those things but unless we recognize that there is a whole system that is supporting a lot of feelings of busyness, of burnout, um, and keeping very specific groups of people down, um, meditation can only do so much. So I'm just putting that out there as why this is an important conversation to have. Right. Um, I, will, I will keep going <laughs> and say that another thing that I really wanna talk about right from the top is that I am new to this line of thinking. I mean, I always thought those mugs of like down with the patriarchy and, and things. I, I always, I, I guess I knew, I knew about sexism and feminism, but I never thought about it as a structural uh, systemic issue. When I say new, I mean the last 10 to 15 years. It's not like super, maybe 20 years. I don't know. When did I go to law school? Like, but um, like <laughs> it's been a while. It's, yeah, it's, been, it's I'm hard not, to remember when that happened, but yes. Yeah, but like <laughs> at some point there was a transition, right? Where I went from sexism because that guy over there is sexist to this is systemic. Right. And it, it does, it takes a thought process. But um, I have also learned a lot about white supremacy and that it affects that it has on our country and the effects that it has on especially the black community but the black and brown communities in our country by listening to black and brown advocates yes and um and indigenous people and mm -hmm. just and listening to what they are saying riley and i are not coming to this because we've had this uh, brand new thought. And we're like, <laughs> no. you know, I think that the white supremacy is pushing the world and our country into a direction. A lot of other amazing people, wonderful people, activists, advocates, artists, I mean, uh, people have, had been, have been saying this. And so uh, one thing we will do in the show notes is where we always include links to articles, but I also wanna make sure that we include um, some links to people that you should follow. Yep. And some of my favorites are then following them on Instagram and then following the people they follow and like really kind of going down the rabbit hole because, um, and then don't just follow them on Instagram, but like find their organizations, find their activities, see what they're doing in real life, um, like the life outside of Instagram. But I think it is really important to just, as we start this conversation that I have learned a lot by listening to other people talk about this. And I just wanted to highlight one person in particular because I I do follow her on Instagram. I do read what she writes. I'm very excited she's coming out with a book. Um, they, she does have events. I've not been to one, but that would be very cool. Yeah. But um, it's the Nat Ministry on Instagram. 
the woman's name is Trisha Hersey. That's who runs the group. But she has been uh, for decades, really, in this space of um, as a theologian, a community leader, a community healer, a community organizer, activist. And she talks a lot about the need for rest and how rest is a form of resistance. And if you are new to, uh, I guess, the resistance, is because that's what people like to call it, in the last couple of years, probably since 2016, um, you know, you can learn a lot about what it takes to be in a decades, centuries long um, fight for equality and justice from listening to other people. So I, this is sort of like, there's a lot of baseline of what we wanted to make sure was said before we jumped into the conversations because we wanted to, um, you know, make sure we were all sort of starting on the, the right foot yeah. on this conversation more than any. Yeah, and I think it's just, it, it, it's also extremely important from the position that Tova and I are in for us to recognize that there are sort of giants in leadership that are well <laughs> well ahead of us and who we have to acknowledge and recognize and thank and show gratitude for and and i don't know all the words um to because we look to those people who have you know have no idea that we're even looking to them but we are <laughs> um to help us and and we're so grateful that they're willing to do the work and to put that emotional energy into what they're doing so that we can learn and we can do better and we can understand yeah. what's happening in a space that you know we don't we don't have the lived experience to be able to understand and yet we want to understand and so it's just um i have a lot of gratitude that yeah people are willing to do that kind of work despite the level of emotional burden that that requires and so and physical and, and mental and all those things but really especially the emotional and energetic burden that that requires so we want to make sure to highlight those things and like tova said we'll put that out there um in our show notes and we'll put it on our social media and all that for for you all to find and be able to also um follow all these folks that we we look to when we're trying to understand different concepts and and things out there in the world um because yeah. you're right by the way just what you're saying i want to highlight there's there's a difference between just doing the work in your community and then also being willing to amplify it to people outside of your community because you're also then opening yourself up to criti criticism and pushback and yep. you know all of these things um and i i benefit from a lot of these people, men and women, mm -hmm. um, but especially a lot of women from willing to open themselves up to criticism and critique and threats. I mean, yeah. I was just listening to a podcast, um, like as I was prepping for this podcast, because I listen to a lot of podcasts and there was um, a conversation happening about, you know, Brett Kavanaugh being really upset because he didn't get to eat cake at a party because there were quiet protesters outside the restaurant and he had to leave early. And then women, members of Congress who speak out, AOC and others, who are physically assaulted and threatened with weapons on the regular. Right. Like, and so while it might not be to that level all the time for, you know, your neighborhood activist and advocate, when especially as people put themselves out in a larger world, we benefit from their knowledge we, and we benefit from them. And it is important to note that that adds a whole other layer of exhaustion um, and uh, to what they're doing. And so I do, I do want to be, like you said, very grateful for yeah. that willingness that they have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why don't we take a quick break? Excellent. Excellent. That's my <laughs> well, suggestion. You, yeah. So we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dive right into the, uh, I hate to say it this way, the meat of the topic. Well, gross. Uh, we'll the the peanut right butter back. and jelly middle the of the topic. Yes, the, the peanut butter, <laughs> the tofu of the topic. I don't know. We'll be right back, everyone. Tova here. I'll admit, when I think of a coach, I immediately think knee-high socks, whistles, and clipboards. 
Is it because I love Ted Lasso? Maybe. I mean, I think it's a good look for you, if I'm being honest. Thanks, I think. Anyway, that's not the kind of coaching we want to talk to you all about. True. We are talking about life and transition coaching, though I do still love a clipboard and a tube sock. Both Riley and I are lucky to have worked with incredible coaches throughout our lives. Before that, though, we struggled with where to start, believing in what coaching could really do for us, and, of course, putting ourselves first. Taking the leap and working with our coaches made all the difference. They gave us direction and support when we needed it most. Now, we are fortunate enough to be coaches ourselves, and we're excited to pay it forward. We can help you figure out where to start, create a roadmap, keep you accountable, and get to living your limitless life. Sounds pretty great. So if you want to figure out your next steps, check out our services at goboldlyinitiative.com slash services. We can't wait to talk to you. Now, back to the show. All right. Welcome back to the show. After that break, we are uh, glad to have everyone back with us. As we were talking about before, uh, before the break, you know, this episode is really about how to kind of deal with a system that is not designed to help us rest or help us let go of the busyness or help us find our jo- find our joy. It's it's just not. And so kind of, you know, what do we do and how do we live within a system that is designed to create a level of exhaustion that is not sustainable? So um, let's get into sort of the the center of this topic. I'm trying to stay away from food analogies. I, I know. It's, I don't, I'm like, how do you even talk about that? Um, <laughs> clearly so, you're hungry. Apparently. I, I mean, I did have breakfast, but um, apparently I'm hungry again. So <laughs> sorry, everyone. Let's get uh, let's get into the topic. Um, I don't know if you want to go through any of this history. Well, me, but... I mean, I did. I did. I mean, poor Riley. I was like, okay, so I thought it was really important that we talk about the history. And, um, but I was like, but I don't think we actually need to talk about the history. I think we just need to know the history. So what I will say, um, because I do want to get to the sort of what is happening in society right now. Why does it feel hard? Um, It feels hard because it is hard. Um, But in the last 200 years, what years? Yeah, I would say 200 years is fair. Um, Pretty much any time there has been a advancement in technology so pick a rev you know pick a revolution is it the industrial revolution right. like is it world war one is it world war two it's sort of like two steps forward for women one step back maybe two steps back maybe three steps back and then one step forward it's it's very you know we were raised with this um concept and am i going to make it three uh three episodes in a row of mentioning Rosie Revere engineer. I think I might, (laughs) Um, you know, where there was like women were in the factories and they, they took over and they, you know, they saved our country. Like they did all this stuff. What they never tell you is the men came home and they were like, cool, thanks. Head on back, get back to that kitchen, making the babies. And they really, as our country has evolved more and more to be, more and more capitalist. I mean, we're always capitalist, but like more capitalist, I guess. I don't know if there's, you know, there is, there are varying degrees of capitalism. Um, We benefited from sending, we as a society, not women, um, benefited from sending women back to do all of this stuff because the world was, the, the country worked if the man, whether it was going to a factory in 1890 or going to the office in 1955, the man benefited from being able to go to the office, work long hours, and literally have no other responsibilities. So he did not have to pick up his dry cleaning, wash his clothing, feed his children, care for his children, educate his children um feed himself frankly like 
someone provided everything he needed. And that is how our society functioned. And so as the last 50, 60 years has taken place, where women have had more progress, where they've had access to contraception, where for, you know, a good 49 year run, they had access to legalized abortions, um, where women were able to get education, where women were able to uh, actually get a credit card without the permission of their father or husband. Um, there were advancements, but our structure, our work, the way our society is supposed to run didn't actually change. <laughs> right. And, and Oops. I would say it's not that it became more cap, cap. I mean, it did become more capitalist, right? But it, it's more industrialized. So we moved yeah. away from agrarian society and closer to capitalism and more industrial. And so at, the more industrialized we become, the less family unit, we have and so the less grandparents living with us the less aunts and uncles living with us the less of that large family unit living together and the more industrialized society we have and people disperse around the country and you see these you know um smaller families with two and a half kids and a white picket fence and one little dog and you're living you know in your planned family development and it's very you know the, this is a certain kind of family obviously because then you also have your your families living in cities and you have your there are still some farming families happening but as you as we move through time and you look at the timeline of what happened in this country at the more industrialized we become the less and less um agrarian we become and so as that happened women became became relegated more and more to parenting and to housekeeping and to those sort of women stereotypical roles and less and less to other sort of co um, community-based roles where you would work together with a whole family and there would be like a whole you know you would like if you were on a farm you would work with the farm together like there's not yeah, well, and people would cook together and people right. would care for children together. It also, you know, the the industrialization, the industrial revolution led to the industrialization of education. Right. And I don't I don't mean that in like, I don't know, some people that I, I don't I mean it in exactly what it says, which is education wasn't always eight o'clock to three o'clock. By the way, the factories close at four or five. Not, you know, somebody had to be home to get the kids. Right. And it was eight o'clock to three o'clock. And it was done in such a way without the thought of, is this the best education for our children? It was just people are working. And so their kids need to go somewhere. Right. And that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but it does go to how the family structure changed yeah and so you know here's some fun statistics for what's happening right now 60 percent of working parents feel burned out shocker i don't know how it's only six. i'm sorry 66 and i still don't know how it's that low um the report found that 68 percent of moms said they're burned out with only 42 percent of dads uh if 66 of parents you know there's more moms answering the, the thing than dads just because the way numbers work um but something interesting and i've read this many 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 times the average time parents spend with their kids and parenting their kids, especially mothers, has actually increased over the last 50 years. So by by many hours, by four hours, by six hours. Um, and oddly enough, at the same time, we're spending more time on parenting. We are also spending more time on working. So it shows that women spend on average 16 more hours a week at their jobs than they did in 1965, right? So sometimes that means that women are working part-time, sometimes means they weren't working in the 60s, but it means a lot more women are in the active workforce. Um, women actually make up more than 50% of the workforce. I mean, just like a smidge more than 50%, but more than 50% of the workforce. And so women are working, mothers are working, they are also parenting their children more, there's less of that get out of my house, come back when the streetlights are on mentality, oh, yeah. right? And so it is clear 
absolutely, there are very specific reasons that people feel, feel more burnt out than they have in the past. Well, yeah. And as we talked about in another episode, you know, the, the push and pull to give your child a like childhood that is full of activity and excitement and, and things to do all the time is enormous. So that just right. contributes to that, that feeling of burnout, right? That urge to be busy all the time, the constant need to take them to this practice and that practice. And I don't know, whatever activity they need to go to or want to go to, I should say. Um, and, and all of that co contributes to more hours spent working because I, parenting is working. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to call it work. I don't know. Other people. Well, it is it work because you pay. So it, you know, we both have jobs that we enjoy, right? I both enjoy this uh, job of ours in coaching and podcasting. And I also enjoy um, my job doing legal technology. I mean, I, why, I have, I've been doing this now for almost 10 years and I have no way to describe my job, but, <laughs> um, but uh, we both enjoy it immensely and you right. can, and, and we, I think, enjoy being parents right. immensely. Um, but it is still something that you can pay someone else to do. Yeah. And so obviously, you know, as a mother, you're not re replaceable in your child's eyes. Yeah. Yes. That's the baseline, of course. But the lunches are replaceable. Like the, the, the picking up and dropping off, much of parenting can actually be outsourced. We're not telling you to outsource it if you don't want to, but what we're saying is if it's something that, so you can pay someone else to do, it is a job. Right. <laughs> and if yeah. you're not doing it, you have to pay someone else to do it, which is a conversation that I have had with my friends who don't work out of the home, who are saying like, you know, I feel bad because I, I can't be that busy. I, I only have, you know, my other kids are school and I only have a three-year-old. And I've said, yeah, but you would be paying someone else an actual job. It is a job to watch a three-year-old all day, especially a three-year-old. Yeah. But like, it is a job to watch children. That's why we pay people to watch children. We don't pay them enough by, and it is a, um, it is an industry dominated by women and they are woefully underpaid and right. also so many it's insanely <laughs> expensive. So I don't know how the numbers work that way, but they do <laughs> that. The people who are doing the childcare do not get paid enough. And yet it is, it's you totally know, totally unaffordable, totally unaffordable. Yeah. Right. I don't, it's I don't know how that, too. yeah, I don't know how that works. Um, but in addition to going to work more, parenting more, um, when they do get to work, women, they, we, I don't know, it's going to be kind of a call women day. They have to worry about this. No, we, we get paid less. Yep. We get promoted less. Our abilities get questioned more. On average, women spend an hour a day, I believe, on what they look like. Uh, you know, fixing the face right. or whatever. Putting I do not. Faces on. I do not do that, so I don't know what don't that know. entails. But <laughs> clearly, um, if you're watching on YouTube, that has not <laughs> happened in <laughs> in my case today. I mean, I got this lipstick thing. <laughs> I don't know. I think it came in like a Bad Fit Fun box. Um, nice. Makes my lips tingle. I like it. Um, but you know, I think that um, it is it is hard. It, you know, the the moral of the story is it feels hard because it is hard. Um, and then right. add the layer of women of color, add the layer of um, anyone who is dealing with, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus, like there are plenty of women who are, as they might say, double onlys, right? Like, yeah. like you, first only, you're the first one and the only one. Double onlys mean you're representing two. So it's that much harder. You yeah. know, black women get questioned more than white women. Black women get promoted less than white women. Black women get paid less than white women. <laughs> and I think it's important to recognize that if that's you, like if, you, if you're the, the only woman in the room, if you're the only black woman in the room, so you're, that's what double only refers to. Right. You're also the person who's being told it's your own fault that you're not getting the things that you want right if if you would just be less aggressive if you would just be you know more efficient if you would if you would only 
I don't know, answer more emails. If you would, whatever the, if right. you, whatever that scenario is that they're telling you you need to do, they're not telling anyone else they need to do that. They're telling you. And oftentimes it's, simply because you're the only woman in the room or you're the only black woman in the room or you're the only, uh, I don't know, person of color in the room. And it and it's not always even conscious to the person that's doing it. And you're often, I find, being gaslit if you raise the issue. <laughs> so it's right. like this endless cycle of frustration and irritation and exhaustion from trying to overcome things that you can't even convince other people that they exist. And that endless smashing your face into a wall of being like, this has happening or this is happening is happening right now. And the other person's like, no, it's not. And it, it's happening to you. It's your experience. You see it. And the other person's like, no, that's not real. It, you know? Yeah that endless frustration that endless cycle and it's affecting your career or it's affecting you know your kids because it impacts like whatever you're trying to do for your kids whether it's at school or a, you know a sports well, team or something like that that kind of exhaustion just eats away at you you know also jen while you're being the double only the first double only um can you um get cake for Bill's birthday this week. Right, exactly. Can you make sure that you have a card? Have you coordinated the gifts for Secretary's Day or Administ Administrative Assistant Day? And we would love if you head up the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion <laughs> Committee because we really obviously. think that we should be doing that. And why haven't you brought more people to apply? Why aren't you doing more there to bring up more people? And it's just like, what now? And I, I'll be honest, I, I did it just the other day. So I have a very good friend who may be listening, um, who is very high up at the company that she is in. She's in the executive board committee, whatever they call it, way high up. And we have talked a lot about the diversity in her company. And the diversity in her company is really good. Um, I mean, some of it is hindered by where it is located, um, mm -hmm. but it is very much in line with and, and better than the out than the community surrounding community until you get the top to the top two tiers and then there are two women out of 24 one man of color no women of color one man of color out of 24 people and i was like well what are you doing about it what like what why first of all the team that works under her is an incredibly diverse group of people because she seeks it out Right. But she's not yet in a position, although she's very capable and will do a wonderful job of it because she thinks it's important, but she's still, it's not her only, she's not the only one whose job it is to make sure that there's more diversity among those 24 people. Right. And yet I put it on her. And so, you know, we all, we all do that. Um, and it, so in addition to all of these things, the statistics that we're parenting more, we're working more. Um, and I, I've, I've read this so many times and I think it's so important. The 35 to 40 hour work week was, and it's 35 hours, right? Cause it's nine to five with an hour lunch, but um, which nobody does anymore, but whatever. <laughs> but the 35 to 40 hour work week was assuming that somebody else was at home doing everything else. Right. And that is not actually happening in most communities. And even if there are families who want that to be the case, right? This is not a moral, I am not judging. If you want to stay no. at home, great, do it. Awesome, fantastic, yeah, wonderful. There's but nothing most, wrong with that. No, it's wonderful. Isn't that the greatest thing about freedom is that you get to decide what you want to do with your life? Absolutely. Like, <laughs> like yay. Um, and I have said on this show, and we'll say every day how thankful I am for women and men who make those decisions and like are able to volunteer and support our communities. Yes. It yes. is our, our communities and our schools require people, unfortunately, that's another story Yeah, well. to be able to volunteer. Right. Um, and so, but in addition to all of that, there is also this feeling and, and we read about this in, in burnout book, but it, it captures what we've all known and read 
which is there's this unspoken assumption that women should be giving everything, every moment of their lives, every drop of their energy to the care of others. And that self-care is selfish. And that it is really the framework that this whole second shift hangs on. This whole concept of, oh, good, you went to the office. But before you went to the office, did you sign the forms? Did you get the lunch together? Did you pack the bags? And then when your kids and spouse, if you have one, came home, um, did you do all the other stuff? By the way, we're talking in the scenario of like the traditional um, yeah. Uh, yeah. husband, wife, caveat. kids, which... Uh, is bananas that we're talking about it, but it is important because that's where a lot of the statistics come from and still, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but I'd also just like to add, if you are, if you marry a spouse and you are in the traditional feminine, like assigned role, like I don't care if you are two men, two women, but if you're like, if somehow in your relationship, there seems to be one that leans towards the feminine side of things. When you get married, you get more housework. Two grown adults get married. Hopefully. Right? Yeah. That's the way. That's why we have laws. Two grown adults get married. One of them gets more housework than the other one. How is that possible? Theoretically, the housework should go down for both of you because, like, now you're not. I mean, this is assuming that you like didn't move in until you got married. So just, you know, blowing up every study that's written in you know from like <laughs> father's house sorority house husband's house kind of basically still how studies are these days but right still it should go down because there's like less double to do and yet the the word for woman or person in the more feminine role that's considered the more feminine role more woman role has more housework how is that possible we're not talking about kids. We're not talking about pets. They just get another adult in their home. If I had another woman move in with me, I think my housework might go down. It would be a delight. Who wants to move into my basement? <laughs> <laughs> anyone, please. Anyone? Please. Anyone? I have a queen size bed. Like, you can sleep on opposite sides. I do not care. Someone help me. No. Um, so this is a thing. This human giver syndrome, this this need to, but it, it is not a thing because we made it up it's not just a thing because women want to do it it is because women are exploited for their nurturing yeah i mean so we do need to take one more quick break so let's take a let's take a break and when we come back i want to talk more about this because this is a very culturally driven creation that doesn't i don't know that it's i mean maybe it's semi-biological but i i think it's really cultural um so we'll take a quick break and we will be right back everyone know what i really love to do uh take baths go for walks read drink margaritas hike yeah, not what I was referring to. You know we're recording a commercial right now. I do, but I'm thinking outside the box, being adaptable. As I was saying, what I love to do is host our live monthly workshops. Oh, right. That's what we were talking about. Me too. They are a lot of fun to put together and host every month. And we can bring margaritas, so... Join us for live conversation as we get a bit deeper into topics near and dear to our hearts. We go through everything from self-care to setting boundaries. We share coaching tips, practical advice, and take questions from the audience. It's a whole lot of fun. Sign up for our newsletter today at goboldlyinitiative.com slash contact to make sure you hear about all the upcoming Go Boldly workshops. You definitely don't want to miss out now. Back to that show. Okay, so welcome back. Um, before the break, we were talking about uh, the human giver syndrome, which I think is such a horrifying description. <laughs> yeah, well, also, we were just 
just before this episode we were talking about the hunger games and so oh yeah that's true <laughs> that's what's in my head and it's yeah that, not... maybe that's why and, like we were talking about lord of the flies yes yeah we um, were. so we could have just weird Which couldn't things. tell you where our heads are at right now <laughs> by the way yes yeah, so we prep we prep for this conversation <laughs> by talking about the hunger games and lord of the flies um, <laughs> but it's like put a horrible image in my head but <laughs> anyway uh this is this is a fun episode um (laughs) sorry everyone if you can't laugh right like i have to be able to laugh or i'll just start crying and then it'll just be a whole episode of you all listening to me crying which is not pretty it's not pretty when it happens i just as an aside because i haven't said this enough recently watch some stand up read a joke book do something laughter is so good for us oh yes Um, I get, I have an app now that I get jokes sent to my phone. Oh, you've got to send me that one. Oh my gosh. They're awful. Like, okay. 90% of the jokes are horrible and they're so funny and I love them so much. And so laugh more. You, these are things you can control. And we just haven't said that recently because we're talking about busyness and worth and it's so heavy and, but like, (laughs) seriously. (laughs) Thank you. I needed that cackle. (laughs) <laughs> it's so yes. heavy but so um, heavy. all right we've got no seriously check. okay laugh some more because this yeah. is serious and this is our lives <laughs> so we should laugh at it um human giver syndrome so as we were saying it really is the this the concept really is something that culturally has been ingrained in women because we are you know, we are trained to be the more nurturing. Ugh, I, I, I struggle with this masculine feminine thing. I think it's because I am more masculine. Um, not that I'm not nurturing, just that like, I don't like this division of masculine feminine. Um, probably because I don't like the patriarchy and I don't like white Well, we both struggle with it like... and we struggle it, with it for different reasons. Yeah, right? I don't like so... the division. And, um, you know, I like, I like energy, not not genderization, um, which I think is a word I just made up. Uh, So, you know, the concept anyway is essentially something that is culturally driven, right? It's this idea that as women, we should just continuously give everything we have until we are left with, you know, nothing. And then we have to regenerate whatever we can and give it all away again. And we should just keep giving and that's you know we have children and we give everything to our children and then we just keep giving we give to our spouse and we give to our eventually you know our elderly parents and we give to and the church and the community right and our neighbors and And schools and pto and i mean nonprofits are by large majority filled with women and run by women um get out the vote efforts are large majority women like how much unpaid work can one gender do? Right. <laughs> a lot. And and the the thing that um the thing that is so upsetting about this cultural belief system and this this sort of way in which it has been ingrained in our society and in our in our women is that it also extends to our bodies in a lot of ways and it extends to this idea that we must give up our our entire selves, not just our energy, but our physicality. And so, you know, it's a big part of rape culture in, in addition. And so the idea that, you know, men are entitled to our bodies in some way because they want them. Or, you know, if you wear short shorts or if you have a short skirt on or if you have a enticing top on or I don't know, whatever. What is an enticing top even? Um, like, I mean, I I'm I wearing a sort that. of crop top, but the only time I ever wear it is when we record a podcast because I don't feel comfortable wearing it out in the world. But not because of men, just because why did I buy a crop top with strawberries <laughs> on it? I don't know. <laughs> because it's amazing. Yeah, um, it, it really is. But no, it, it, it leads into that conversation of, you know, if I am a human giver, meaning all I do all day long is give and I give of myself, I give my time, I give my energy, I give... I give, I give, I give, then if a man sees me walking down the street and decides, you know, oh, I'm interested in that woman and she doesn't, you know, this is, I'm speaking from personal experience. I want to talk to her and she, you know, I'm like, hey, 
I'm not going to repeat the words, but hey, lady, uh, and she doesn't repeat, you know, say anything to me, then I can get angry, right? I can get mad about it and I can get in her face and I can say, why aren't you talking to me? And she, and she doesn't say anything back to me. Then I can get even more angry and I can tell her she has to smile for me because she owes me a smile because she's a human giver, right? And then it escalates and it escalates and it escalates. And this is the level of entitlement that becomes problematic on the male side of this this equation and people will dismiss this as if nah that's your that's exaggeration that's not real that doesn't happen of course it does it happens all the time and it is related to human giver syndrome there has to be a point at which this all begins so people like to think these are just one-off scenarios that happen oh for no reason there's just like a bad guy out there no, there's not. There's a whole culture that creates this belief in which people are entitled to other people. People are entitled to treat other people the way they feel like. They're entitled to take what they want because they can. And it comes yeah. from somewhere. And the violence you're referring to, first of all, in in countries that women well, taking away a woman's rights is a beginning process to basically mayhem in a country. But in countries that don't, that women don't have the rights to speak or they're getting paid unfairly or there's more expectation on them, this human giver concept, right? It is also accompanied not just by violence on a woman's emotions and ideas, but also physical violence, right? And so... While we are probably not going to, because we're already, you know, wrapping up the end of this conversation, we're not going to get into the physical violence that takes place against a woman, but it happens and it happens a lot and it happens in societies where women are not valued. So there is a connection between human giver syndrome, a woman's work in the home not being valued, a woman's work at work and the being given unpaid tasks all the time even from note taking you know you look around a table there's five women or five men and a woman the woman gets asked to take the notes now she cannot be part of that conversation because she's taking notes ask a man to do it right um but those things then are connected to the same society where we don't believe women and where men think it is okay for them to take whatever they want from a woman including physical violence it is all connected and the problem the problem um <laughs> is that we are in a world in a country specifically where it is a capitalist country and the structure of it and and I'm, I'm not against capitalism so please don't think that i am because i think there's lots of ways for that capitalism is really fantastic and it can work really quite well um, but the structure of our capitalism is based on patriarchal and white supremacy, I don't have a word, supremacy views. And so it is based on people doing work for free. I mean, quite clearly, there was a huge swath of our country in the founding of our country where the entire economy was based on a third of the people doing work for free because they were slaves they were enslaved people so let's not pretend that right. our economy has not in our country has not always been based on a group of people in our country doing unpaid work or work for less money and so whether it is men who are paid less because of what we've determined their race is because they're black or brown whether it's women who are paid less, it is we still have the whole system is based on people being paid less. And then a huge majority of people, 50% or more of the people doing unpaid work to supplement the lives of other people. That is how our economic system is based. And it is based then, there's that layer and it's layered on top of the the patriarchy and the need to uphold male domination and whether we are your woman or a man whether you're white or not we are part of the system and we are either benefiting from it 
or we are losing because of it. And oftentimes, uh, as a white woman, we're doing both. <laughs> yes. Um, and we are both benefiting from the system of white supremacy, whether we believe it or not, you are. And we are also um, hurt by the system of the patriarchy. But do not make the mistake of thinking that our economy and our whole capitalist system, once again, capitalism does not have to look like this. But in our country, it does. It looks at people doing unpaid work. So... <laughs> On that uplifting note, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, look, this is a hard conversation. And it's a hard conversation in the sense that it is hard to wrap your mind around things like this when you've never allowed yourself to go there, right? Like, if you've never allowed yourself this the the mental space to think about the past, if you, like, if you grew up on bad U.S. history classes, like, it, you know, if you have never spent the time to understand how this country was built, if you've, you know, hidden under a rock and gone, I don't really want to think about that because it's too awful to think about. It makes me feel guilty. I feel ashamed. You know, these are hard feelings and it's hard to deal with. And, and I get it. But that doesn't mean you can't do it right that doesn't mean you can't face these things and start to address the reality in which you live and it also doesn't mean you have to walk around feeling ashamed and like oh i've got to go out and fix it now you, you know you're not going to wake up tomorrow and solve this problem this that's not what's going to happen but you can wake up tomorrow and start thinking about it and addressing your role in yeah. what your life looks like and how you participate and how you live that's what you can do and so as i you know as i talk to my kids about these kinds of things and myself frankly is it's a day-by-day -day experience and you have a choice you have a choice to make about how you react how you participate and how you behave you can't change the past you can't um, change other people's behavior but you can you can impact your own behavior and your own choices. And I think that that's, you know, that's a good lead into what our homework is for the next week. And um, just, you know, I want to leave everyone with the understanding that we know this is a process and it's, yeah. it's not easy for everyone. It's, I mean, it certainly isn't easy for me. I am the first to acknowledge I make mistakes all the time. I'm open to criticism. I'm open to explanation. I'm open to someone being like, that was a stupid thing to say. <laughs> you know, like, listen, I'm learning all the time. And all I want to do is learn and get better and know better and do better. And if you can walk through life with an openness and a willingness to learn and change and grow so that you are not hurting other people, or making things worse for other people. I think that that kind of mindset is 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 the best way to come, in my opinion, is the best way to come at things so that you can be a partner in the world and a partner in improving other people's situations and your own situation. And just being open to listening and not being defensive or critical is, um, is one of the best ways you can do that. So Tova, I'm going to turn it over to you for the homework for the week and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. So the homework is, uh, well, thank you. And, uh, the homework is sort of, it's a lot of self-reflection. Um, I, and I might put a, add a few like little extra tasks here, but I think one, one area, like if you're really thinking about just how do we view women and men, right? So one thing you can think about, you can write about, or you can just think about throughout the week is, you know, am I assuming a woman or this woman in particular that I'm speaking with has a moral obligation to be pretty, happy, calm, generous, or attentive to the needs of others? Because even as women, we do attach those things to other women, right? And so you need to be thinking about, am I, do I, have I set expectations for this person that I'm talking to? Um, and, and for the flip side, am I assuming this man has a moral right and obligation to be competitive and 
acquisitive to take and have anything he can, regardless of the impact on others. Do we give free passes to people, right? So those are things that we do in our just in our life on the regular that we need to be aware of. The next question is, how can I contribute to a patriarchal system? How do I? Not how can I? How am I? <laughs> Let's not contribute to it. Right. How am I contributing to a patriarchal system? What am I doing every day to make it worse? Uh, to make the patriarchy fall? I, I'm, 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 I'm confused with my words. So how am I contributing? How can I stop contributing? What can I do? And the same thing goes for white supremacy. How am I contributing to the system? And what can I do to stop contributing to the system and to make it better? And lastly, we have talked a lot about, you know, surrounding yourself with people or views that you are uncomfortable with. Is this is the first time you're having some of these conversations? Like I said, we're going to put a list of people that we would suggest that you follow on Instagram. It is a good first start, a good first step, not a last step, but a good first step to broadening what you're hearing. And I would say you go in there and you listen and that's it. <laughs> you just listen. Yeah. Um, and so follow some people that are outside your comfort zone. Follow people that are talking about things that you feel maybe not comfortable with and sit with that and think about why you're not comfortable. But definitely um, check out our show notes and follow some people on Instagram. If Instagram's not your thing, look them on the show notes and see where their organizations are, see what they're saying, read what they're saying. Um, we do always include lots of resources um, and these are extra long. Now, I will do a caveat with these. There's a wide variety of information that is put in our resources section um, specifically to this one. So just, you know, take it with what it's, what it's saying. But um, definitely, I mean, I even included an article that we didn't talk about at all, but how burnout and white supremacy culture affects dietitians. Because I just thought that was really interesting. I mean, it is everywhere. So let's use this as an opportunity to do better. And uh, sounds good. Yeah. With yeah. All right. Well, we will be back next week with another episode. Um, well, actually, an interview. We will be uh, here, same time, same place. So hopefully we will see you all then. And uh, you will have a good week working on this homework. Reach out to us anytime on all the social media channels. And until then, we will see you here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to We Go Boldly podcast. We know you're busy and we love spending time with you. If you enjoyed this week's episode, let us know. Head to Apple Podcasts right now to rate and review our show. While you're there, be sure to click that subscribe button. Want more us time? Follow us on all the socials at Go Boldly Together. Want even more us time? As in all the coaching pizzazz. Find us at GoBoldlyInitiative.com for all the info. We will be back with more excitement, research, and deep thoughts next week. Until then, keep on being the bold, brave, amazing people we know you already are.